Welcome, everybody, to the Norwegian News with Father Deacon Ann Nias. I am honored today to have our special guest, Dr. Josh Rasmussen, um, who actually is a philosophy professor at Azusa Pacific University in Southern California, sunny Southern California. Uh, Josh had got his PhD in uh, philosophy at Notre Dame, and uh, I was actually privileged and honored to work with Josh while I was a professor of philosophy uh, at Azusa Pacific University as well. But welcome, Josh. Thank you so much. Why don't you um, tell us a little bit about your background, um, your interests, and maybe possibly current work that you're doing right now? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Father Deacon. It's great to be with you on your show. Um, so yeah, I'm just very excited about my current work, which is always on the foundations of things, foundations of existence. And my latest project is on the foundations of mind, which I actually think mind is foundational to existence. And so maybe we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that. But uh, my next book project will be on the nature of persons. Yeah, I think right. persons are primary to everything. Good, good. We've got some similarities there. And uh, Dr. Rasmussen does some wonderful work um, and has done, I think you had a recent published work um, on some various uh, arguments that you developed for the existence of God, which uh, I don't know if you want to speak to the audience a little bit about that. Yeah, How Reason Can Lead a God is my, my latest book. It's kind of a signature book so far. Maybe my next book will be my signature book. But so far of my books, this is, this is kind of the one that I'm the most proud of because it's a culmination of my work in philosophy. I talk about the foundation of matter, the foundation of mind, the foundation of morals, even the foundation of reason. So I've got different chapters on those things. And that book is a quest into the nature of reality. And my basic argument is that, that there needs to be a foundation and that this mm -hmm. ultimate foundation of things has the resources for making mind, matter, morals, reason. Mm -hmm. And I end up arguing that it actually has a supreme nature. So I call it a supreme foundation. Good, good. And this is going to work perfect for our discussion today because we're really talking about foundations, um, both in terms of epistemology mm -hmm. and then um, obviously, you know, what sort of arguments for the existence of God can we make on um, mm -hmm. those foundations? And are they actually good foundations? So I really appreciate that. You also had a chance to, uh, I don't remember how long ago that was, uh, speak with the philosopher Dan Ende, uh, Graham Oppie, Dr. Graham Oppie, right? Uh, yeah, I've had a couple of conversations with him yeah. online, which were great, fantastic. I have a lot of respect for him. I, right. I, I feel like we have some similar ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of anticipate a kind of convergence of worldview uh, over time. We'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, he's, he's a great interlocutor on yeah, the foundations absolutely. of things. Um, and I think he's really a good, I look forward to speaking with him. We had some correspondence and perhaps... Um, we'll do a discussion as well because uh, he is a good philosopher. He's a good thinker. Um, mm -hmm. And it's nice to be able, any of the kind of ideas that, and arguments we're working on, you know, not to be in an echo chamber, but to to give it to people who are actually really good, who could push back. and um, Yeah, who have different views. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we'll push back and help clarify things for sure. Yeah, I find that very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise, um, might think an argument's great and it's not. <laughs> well, this is actually perfect that you're saying this because I wanted just to say like my view about the purpose of arguments is not just to sort of reinforce or defend a prior belief. I like to think of arguments as tools for discovery. And so even when I'm thinking of an argument, I'm laying out steps that are open for analysis. Mm -hmm. And those steps, I feel like they provide a kind of platform for kind of organizing a conversation that leads to more discovery. Yeah. And so I think it's so helpful to think of arguments as servants for discovery, because I think when you think of arguments that way, they actually do help more people to see more things. But in my experience, if I think of arguments merely as a kind of reinforcer of something, sometimes it can almost have the opposite effect. Um, it, it can almost like block, it can create a wall and it blocks progress of understanding of it divides people into positions and decides. And so we're not really working together. 
uh, to discover more. And I think it really helps when we can all sort of come together and look at an argument as, as something that can help us to see more together. That's when philosophy is done well. And it's very enjoyable. And then it has the extra advantage of coming back and helping your own thoughts um, yeah. and working that out too. So I appreciate it. It doesn't always happen that way, um, but that's why I'm really enjoying having a conversation with you that uh, there, there are those thinkers and philosophers where uh, you can really benefit um, from your wisdom and uh, comments and feedback on these various Well, with you, my goal isn't a collaboration. My goal is to destroy you with an argument. I'm just yes, <laughs> Or to reinforce your beliefs, which right. I would be happy to Turns do. Turns out I'm right once again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's right. So, yeah, part of um, tonight's or today's conversation, wherever you are in the world, is uh, to talk about the nature of philosophy. And both you and I share some, um, the values. Obviously, we have a career is teaching philosophy at the university. And we we're also both Christians, and we want to be able to use that in our own faith and give glory to God in our work. And so I think that's something nice that maybe you could speak on. Yeah, to see philosophy as a tool that you can use to expand your understanding. And something I've been thinking about a lot lately is the way in which people will kind of package ideas into a system. And then sometimes what will happen is people will get kind of caught into the system and they'll use philosophy maybe only to reinforce a system um, rather than to expand one's understanding. And I think if philosophy is kind of, well, philosophy is love of wisdom. So this is sort of how I think of it is like people from around the world can be chasing after wisdom. Everybody sees different things. Everybody has different experiences, different perspectives. So everybody can have different uh, let's say elements to bring to the table or um, pieces of light. I don't know if that's the right metaphor, but things that they see. And so I think of philosophy as kind of like arguments. It's a tool, it's a servant that can serve us in our discovery of things. And I do see that from my own uh, journey, that, that reason is a light that works with evidence to reveal a glorious universe. And there are, of course, things in the universe, there are tensions, there are problems, there are trials. But my understanding is that philosophy ultimately can reveal that reality has a, a level or a layer that is fundamentally good, that reality is in a sense on your side, if I could use that language, and that there's nothing to be afraid of in just finding out more about the world. By the way, well, if I, mean, ever... I guess there could be because you could find out the world is fundamentally tragic and bad um if you ever but, run for office you got to have that for your um you know a slogan reality is on your reality side. is on your side <laughs> that's right yeah it's Vote like an empowerment me. reality thought. is on your side um, so you know there's different schools uh, obviously in philosophy but also and when it comes to theology and arguing also for the existence of god um, that maybe we should talk about. Uh, there's terms that are thrown out. And as you know, sometimes, well, it depends what you mean by that term. And we can have a conversation about that. But typically, what are some of the, the schools of thought or ways of approaching trying to argue for God uh, that we could name that, that maybe a, a lot of our viewers would be familiar with? Uh -huh. And then we can kind of unpack that and what sure. does it mean and the subdivisions within there. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a kind of classical approach where you give arguments from nature um, to a sort of first cause of the effects. And then you argue from the observations you make in nature. I mean, in uh, the biblical text you have in Romans, the idea that God's power, his eternal power and divine nature are manifest through the effects, through the things that we see. And so there is this kind of argument for God from those things that we see. And then sometimes what will happen is that once you've laid a foundation 
uh, a theistic foundation, then you can begin to build on that and argue for more specific claims about God's interaction, let's say, with beings in the earth and sort of how that works. Um, another school of thought, which is sometimes seen as a sort of polar contrast, would be a kind of presuppositional view, which you were mentioning before the show, uh, where you don't really argue for God from, let's say, a common ground or common observations. Mm -hmm. But one version of this would be that that uh, the knowledge of God is a precondition for knowledge of other things. In that sense, it's, it's presupposed um, at the foundation of one's system. You might say there are different versions of precept. Uh, obviously, you might want to speak to the particular versions that you would think. But um, and then there are different schools kind of within those. Mm -hmm. My own kind of tendency, and this is maybe coming from my personality, is to see how we can kind of bring the best out of the different views together instead of having sort of an endless competition between the views. It's not to say that there are there can't be some approaches than others. It's just to say that I think that every approach has something of value. And I think different people might even resonate to different approaches based on their own personality. So just to illustrate a little more on this, for me, I always love my favorite subject. And my personality is to try to sort of see things, universal principles that people across the, the world could check independently from their perspective, and then see if I can build from there a pathway uh, to an interesting conclusion. Just let reason lead, right? And because that's my personality, I like that classical approach. It appeals to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that that's kind of what resonates with me. But then I can also appreciate that on the other side, that there are all sorts of things that we know, uh, but we don't just have to argue for them. Like, so for example, uh, I know that I'm thinking right now. Uh, I have this knowledge. Now there are potential examples that I, I know that I've got a hand. And if you ask me, what's my argument that I have a hand or what's my argument that I'm thinking? Well, it'd be kind of hard to build, let's take the thinking conclusions. Like, well, how do I argue that I'm thinking? I mean, I have to, for any argument, I have to first be thinking in order to verify the premises in that argument to see that I'm thinking. It seems like it's more just basic. And so um, one could argue that knowledge of God could also be basic in a similar way. Um, it's, it's a starting point that one could have fixed in one's mind. Maybe it's based on a kind of acquaintance with God or an aspect of God in the same way that I would say that my knowledge of my thinking is based on acquaintance with my thinking. Right. So I'm, I'm also open to that. That's good. So the former, the, the, what you were first discussing could be labeled as uh, natural theology. Um, and you could also have, which I guess could be distinct from natural theology, would simply just kind of be, as you'd said, you know, classical arguments for the existence of God. Yeah. Um, because, for example, I'm trying to think, we wouldn't classify Descartes as a natural theologian, but perhaps he makes a, a classical, a type of, his kind of, ont his two ontological arguments. Would, would you think that they fall into classical arguments for the existence of God? Um, yeah. I would what are some of the that. typical ones that we could name for our audience that would be, you might know, you might have recognized these arguments from the previous film, no, from the previous books, um, and these are the kind of general classical arguments for the existence of God that you might be familiar with. Uh, what would you say? On well, those? so there's, right, the argument, uh, cosmological argument from cause and effect, an argument for design, different versions of this, there's a fine-tuning argument, Paley's argument from analogy, comparing the design of biological systems with, let's say, a watch or something like this. Um, then there's ontological arguments, which you could think of those as arguments from reasoning about the nature or the concept of God. Um, those are kind of the three big classical ones that people think of. Another argument that I find very interesting, and I hope that we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about it today, is this kind of argument from mind. Uh, there's different elements of mind, like consciousness, reasoning, intentionality, and there are arguments from mind to a foundational mind which is a very interesting kind of argument. There are also arguments from beauty. You know, why, why is there even, even if beauty is purely subjective, why does reality unfold in such a way that there are beings who can have a sense that some things are beautiful? That's sort of a striking thing. 
And there's also a kind of like umbrella argument. I've been thinking about how uh, to sort of summarize this in terms of just a, a picture of you as a person that contains within you uh, biological complexity, um, consciousness. Um, oh, I didn't mention the, the sense of morality. So the argument from right and wrong or moral standard. So you get morality, design, cause and effect. Uh, you know, and then the fact that you exist is already something that there is existence and that points us back to a kind of ultimate self-existence to explain mm -hmm. how there could be any existence. So that would be sort of a set of familiar classical arguments. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm actually kind of curious to hear your thoughts about, about those arguments, if, what you think about them, if, if you like them, if you think they all fail or <laughs> some of them that you like more than others, or what do you think? Yeah, uh, I used to. Um, I used to use a lot of those arguments, and I think two things that were kind of impetus to to dive into this a little bit further were just questions about knowledge within epistemology in general. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the longer I've been in um, the Eastern Orthodox Christian faith, you know, looking at how did the, the, the fathers, the church fathers and, and the, the early church um, approach and argue for these things? And are they the same? Obviously, as Eastern Orthodox, we see there's eventually a departure um, between the West and Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it actually has to do with um, the kind of system and projects that they, they embraced and that ultimately, um, with other things involved too, um, became uh, irreconcilable. And that caused me to kind of think about why did this happen? Um, how did it happen historically? Why does one side um, tend to take this kind of approach and the other? And I mm -hmm. think a lot of that changed my own position on thinking about the arguments. Um, I was familiar with the reformed presuppositional apologetics and, and transcendental arguments, saw problems with that, um, but didn't know if, I, th I thought they might be on to something that could be worked out. So I think it'd be wonderful just to have a conversation about what possibly could be some epistemological concerns with the kind of classic like natural theological arguments that like let's look at nature yeah and, and could we reason and then i could get some feedback from you on what you yeah. think about on that yeah i would love to hear some of your thoughts on that some of your concerns or objections mm -hmm. uh i guess one would be first the way that in the West they talk about uh, fides et ratio, faith and reason, and I believe they define, and we could just go to the giants on what natural theology, how they define that. But typically, I remember, and you know, I was schooled in Thomistic thought, and so I was very much immersed in this kind of thinking, and it got me to think later upon it. But Aquinas defines um, natural theology as what the intellect by the natural light of reason alone can know about the world and about God Yeah. without free, first presupposing faith and divine revelation. And so Aquinas will say in the Summa Theologica that uh, the existence of, of God is not an article of faith, but a preambula to the faith, much like they'll talk about that uh, natural knowledge is understood to be presupposed by faith just in the same way that nature is presupposed by grace. And so what seemed to me on further reflection is that there's this kind of distinction, a sharp distinction in the way that they, and you quoted the Romans, the way that Aquinas would understand, for example, Romans would be very different then let's say the the Eastern fathers mm -hmm. would, um, for example, 
when I was uh, a Thomist, I read that that by God, St. Paul is talking about uh, a cosmological argument there. We can mm-hmm. look at reason, I sorry, we can look at nature in the, the sense, you know, in our senses and experience and reason up affect cause to know that uh, there is a God, a, f- a first, you know, cause or something like that. And the Eastern Fathers read that very differently, in part because they have a doctrine uh, called that, you know, the essence energies distinction, and that is Dimitri Staniloy um, states that the distinction between natural revelation and special revelation, there really isn't the distinction because all mm-hmm. of nature is shot through with the energies and presence of God. Mm-hmm. And not in kind of a causal mechanistic way, but really God, not in his essence, but his activities, his eternal activities. Yeah. And energies such that um, all men know uh, about God um, in a very different way than simply kind of reasoning through effects and causes. Um, so. That's one as and we could talk some more about what your thoughts are. Oh, that, that's that. interesting because I, I mean I kind of see a synthesis there um, between that view of God sort of being in all things and even God's role in bringing knowledge in every case of knowledge. I sort of think of that as maybe consistent with or maybe even a way of illuminating what it is that we do when we're reasoning. So I mean there is this idea of like reason is a completely sort of God devoid activity. It's not spiritual in any, th- in any sense. It's kind of mechanical. Um, the view that I've come to is it, it feels similar to what you're articulating because the idea is that God really does pervade everything. That even the activity of reasoning is a kind of contact, contact with the divine mind. Mm-hmm. So that when I'm perceiving, for example, uh, principles of reason, like the law of non-contradiction or the law of identity, that what I'm actually doing there is I'm, I'm coming into acquaintance with a kind of uh, eternal truth, which is embedded or reflecting of an eternal nature, which is, of course, God's nature. And that my very ability to even do that is, let's say, in the context of a universal mind. Um, and so when I, I mean, to be honest, like when I started thinking about, okay, well, what makes that mode of knowing like different from when Christians will talk about like God's spirit revealed it to me? Mm-hmm. Well, did God's spirit reveal it to you through any kind of a process through, was it through maybe a sense that something was true? You know, if you have a sense that something is, is right or wrong or true or good or beautiful, uh, you know, is, is there some sense that is God's spirit and some other sense that isn't in connection with God's spirit. And I mean, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. I don't know how to make a a clear dividing line. It seems kind of uniform in the sense that if any sense is spiritual, they're all spiritual. If any sense requires a universal mind, they all do. And so, you know, or going the other way, if any sense doesn't, then none of them do. (laughs) Um, But since I do think that God is at work in all things, God as the, the foundational mind is at work in all things, um, in, in cooperation with creation, I do tend to think of all of my senses as, in a significant sense, spiritual, if that makes sense. I mean, vocabulary kind of breaks down at some point. I'm not sure what language to use. But I'm curious what you think about about um, this and, and whether there might be a way of integrating a understanding of a classical argument with what you just described in terms of God's role in things. God's role in knowledge. Yeah, I, I think uh, your intuition is really good in that if you look into the energies doctrine of uh, Gregory Palamas and um, you know Saint Basil and these things, that that really gives us a good understanding of how like how God is present everywhere, um, and that there isn't these kind of sharp distinctions between the way that we would know something through faith or directly to the innermost being of man versus reason. 
Mm-hmm. Why? Because if God's presence is spelled out in all his divine energies, imminent in the world, which allows his essence to be both transcendent, but also really present in yeah. the world in all things. I wish I could find this quote from uh, Demetrius Stanoy because it's really good. Let's see. Because it talks about, let me see real quick, just bear with me. I had some notes up here. This sounds very familiar. I feel like I was just reading about about what you're talking about like a month ago. Just kind of came across it and was resonating with it. I was like telling my wife, hey, look at this. The idea that the faculties aren't divided categorically and the, the, the energies and the role of that in things. Right. Um, so I would say, and again, let's get, after we, we speak about this, we can get in further detail about, because my main critique of natural theology would be the, the type of epistemological methods or things that I would say are ultimately unfounded. So I'm happy that um, somebody would use their reason to get to God, but I would hope that they get there for the right reasons. Uh-huh. Um, that, you know, I'm sure people will believe in God for bad reasons. And um, so that's kind of one of my critique. But Demetrius Stanley, in kind of talking about the in the Orthodox Church, it never seems to make this sharp dist- distinction. And I think you're actually picking up on this too and are excited to actually talk about and, and work this out, that your knowing doesn't have any a- epistemic autonomy or sharp distinction. Um, it doesn't have any epistemic uh, autonomy to natural reason. And so there's no real sharp distinction between what is... N- because you really see this in kind of scholastic thought, um, a, separate, a, a, a sharp distinction between what's called natural reason and, and then also um, supernatural revelation or something like that. Mm-hmm. And Demetrius Stanley in responding to that says, quote, natural revelation is known and understood fully in the light of supernatural revelation or we might say that natural revelation is given and maintained by God continuously through his own divine act, which is above nature. That is why St. Maximus, a confessor, does not posit an essential distinction between natural and supernatural revelation or a biblical yeah. one. According to yeah. him, this latter is only the embodying of the former in its historical persons and actions. I think that's a great yeah. quote, and I think you were actually hitting on that. Yes, exactly. And well, people who know my work know that I have a hard time with this distinction between the natural and the supernatural. I'm actually just not sure how to define it. And, uh, you know, I, I think of God as working through nature. I think of nature as itself a uh, reflection of mental activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so God's thoughts form laws and even the material world is a reflection of, of informational states um, that results in, Transact causal transactions between minds and persons. And so at what point am I going to say that there's some event that's supernatural? I'm not sure how to, how to define that. I'm not sure how to make that distinction. Yeah. It's uh, and it could be, is to be Tristanoli pointed out a false dichotomy Yeah, that um, you're really thinking about incorrectly, but let's talk a little bit about some concerns that I have with um, in light of reflections about, and I hope all philosophers and not just epistemologists would think about this. <laughs> Actually, I hope all people and not just all beings. Uh, what is knowledge possible? Um, how do I know things? What would be the kind of first principles that because we all assume that we have it? Yeah. But as we know, in many aspects in life, just because you assume that you have something doesn't mean that you actually do. Right. And so somebody, when they go further into this, oh, that's really interesting. Where would I start? What justifications would actually be justifications for me knowing? Because if, if one makes an argument and the skeptic's really right that knowledge is not possible, then that calls into obviously the question of the whole, you know, can you give an argument? Um, it presupposes that you can actually have knowledge. 
And so I guess that's one of my concerns is that natural theologians, these kind of classical arguments typically use a, a classical foundationalist epistemology. And we could talk about this. There might be some problems with that, you know, as, as epistemic problems. Yeah, that, I would love to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to clarify a difference between a classical foundationalist and a kind of moderate foundationalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good. Thank you. Let, tell the audience. So, so on a classical view. OK, so let me just back up. You can sort of divide all theories of uh, knowledge into three. So one theory is that each item of knowledge comes from another item of knowledge in an infinite chain. So in order for you to know anything, Father Deacon, you'd have to know an infinite number of things. Okay. And even that infinite chain, it's bottomless, right? So even it depends on knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, another view, so they call that the infinitism. Uh, another view would be that knowledge uh, comes in a circle. So some items of knowledge depend on other items of knowledge back on the first items, it's, well, there's no first, just a circle. So A on B on C on A. And then a third option would be a foundationalist picture where some items of knowledge are basic in the sense that they're not based on other items of knowledge. It's not that they're not based on anything. Maybe they're based on experience or acquaintance with the world or God's spirit um, act activating the knowledge in some way. Um, so it's not that it's not based on anything. It's just not based on other items of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So these are a basic, um, uh, a basic platform for inferred knowledge. So you've got inferred knowledge and then basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. All right. So this, this structure where you've got inferred knowledge and basic knowledge, that's called foundationalism, as you know. And then the classical foundationalist says something about the basic items of knowledge. And usually the idea is that um, these basic items of knowledge are certain infallible, self-evident, perhaps even universal for all rational beings. Uh, and a picture of this is sometimes like uh, a yeah, upside down pyramid. pyramid where you've got a few certain things. And then the and then you begin, structure on top. Yeah. Then you begin to infer other things, right? And so on this classical model, you start with something like, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, well, how do I know I'm thinking? Well, um, well, there's that argument, I think, therefore I am. So Maybe the idea is I exist because if I were to deny my existence, then I would recognize that my denial exists and I couldn't deny my existence unless I existed. Okay, so you have something that's clear that's at the foundation, such as that I exist or that I'm thinking, and but there's not a lot of things there and then everything else is inferred. That's the classical view. My view is not the classical view, so I accept a more moderate foundationalism mm -hmm. in that I do think that there are some foundational items of knowledge that aren't based on other knowledge in an infinite regress or in a circle. So I do think there are some basic items. I don't think that those basic items need to be certain. Um, they don't need to be infallible. They don't need to be self-evident. And here also is an important point that I, I really wanted to share with your audience kind of right from the beginning of our conversation, which is that on my view, this is an important part of my, my view, is that your knowledge might depend on your unique experience, perspective, or place in the world. And it may not be universal. Maybe nobody else has your knowledge. And some of that might be basic. So it's because you had a certain experience that you got this basic item of knowledge. And it's not universal. You can't find it in a, in a textbook somewhere else. And some people will say, oh, well, it's not universal. Therefore, you shouldn't claim to have knowledge. And so people, I think, almost like give up their own claims to know things if they think that in order for it to count as knowledge, it has to be universal. But I think that actually knowledge is personal and it's based on personal experience. And this is part of why I think well, we, we do need each other. That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we need each other because, I mean, it sounds almost trivial, but I think people miss this because the way that knowledge was handed to us in our youth was from authorities speaking of it in impersonal terms. Like here are the facts, you know, Columbus, you know, it, it's like we learn the dates, we learn the characters and it's given to us in the third person, not in the first person. So we sort of imagine that there's a sort of objective knowledge that's known and those are the facts. And then if you have something that's just your own personal feeling of something, then we call that an opinion and we don't say that it's knowledge. Even if it's something like 
I have this personal knowledge that I had a cup of coffee this morning. And that's not universal. And there's no physical evidence anymore for that. I mean, it, the evidence has been destroyed. You know, all I have is my own personal experience and I can report that. Uh, but I mean, I would say that that's as much knowledge to me as that, as anything, you know, as that the earth is round. I mean, it's like I'm as sure that I had coffee this morning as that, that the earth is round, even though the earth being round is more universal. Yeah. So I wanted just to make sure distinctions. By the yeah, way. that that is clear. So that, let's just recap. Uh, you can be a foundationalist without you, being there's a varieties foundation. of foundationalism. Yep. Classical foundationalism. Um, what's also called what strong foundationalism. Yeah. Um, and then I guess you could have two varieties within that one out of the kind of Cartesian rationalist, um, you know, position um, in which your starting points um, are indubitable thoughts or basic or based on reasoning rather than based on, let's say, empirical senses. Right. Um, and then you have the empiricist, which that really the tradition comes out of the history of Aristotle is kind of the, the par excellence uh, example of kind of an empiricist uh, classical foundationalist that you start with your kind of givens your, your self-evident sensings or um, what would we say uh, self-evident propositions or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you nicely spelled out too, but um, recently, you know, there's varieties of, Found it. And all of those, uh, by the way, of the classic or the strong foundationalism would say that not only does the superstructure of beliefs that are inferred from other beliefs need to come down um, to what we'd call basic. So I and by basic, what how did we define that things it's that are not, not analyzed and further beliefs or reasons yeah. or um, or inferred from other beliefs beliefs or reasons, but they give the additional qualification that, but they're indubitable. So not only are those foundations need to be basic, they need to be indubitable, that you can't yeah. question them. In contrast, you would spelled out nicely, um, a more modest uh, foundationalism it says, look, I don't need in order to have basic beliefs in them to be justifications them to be incorrigible or indubitable. Is that correct? Did I get your position? Yeah, yeah, more or less. And there are distinctions in between those. There are varieties of foundationalism, but yeah, that's a nice summary. Okay, good. And then also, I like what you had to say that knowledge is personal, because when we get in later to talk about when I'm thinking about and trying to explore what would it be necessary in order to even have knowledge? I mean, are there things that would make knowledge impossible? Um, that I would say one of the necessary conditions would be that it needs to be personal. For example, I'm not really yeah. sure how impersonal forms or causes could ever lead to knowledge. And yeah. you can think about all the like kind of counter examples of, um, you know, something causally determining you. And we would say, I don't think that's a good reason to believe something to be true. Oh, no, that's really good. In fact, we can even make a, a more striking and more modest claim that illustrates what you just said, which is that let's say that ultimate reality were purely made of cheese. That's it. I think that on that hypothesis, there would never be knowledge because cheese can never produce knowledge, right? right? Now you're generalizing this and you're saying, okay, well, Cheese couldn't produce knowledge, neither could chocolate, neither could anything that's just, you know, neither could glass, neither could rocks, anything that's just mindless would never be a foundation for mind, for, for knowledge. Anything that's mindless and not rational would never be a foundation for knowledge. You know what this reminds me of? In philosophical analysis, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, in order to relate or compare two things that are, need, that are different, that you need a principle of likeness, like knows like. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this is exactly what sets up the mind-body problem. And when you kind of categorize things um, either ontologically or conceptually in polar opposition, so if you list it out, uh -huh. All the properties of what I think mind is: first-person subjective, it's intentional, doesn't occupy space, 
Um, it is, what are some of the other things that we could say about? You don't think mind occupies space? I mean, there you are. Um, oh, Your sorry, body. it occupies a space, but let's say in the traditional sense um, that- I'm just kind of playing with you. Oh, okay. you? <laughs> yeah, I, there's a, obviously there's a debate. Yeah, you know what there. I'm saying? And then you define yeah. the physical um, to be just the opposite. It's non-intentional, it's extended yeah. through space. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, oh my gosh, on what grounds am I going to be able to relate the two, either ontologically or causally or conceptually, we've got yeah. a problem here. I would say the same with knowledge that if, the, if you can't draw out some principle of likeness, obviously we're persons and we like to assume that we have knowledge. I'm not sure how one would cash it out that Okay, but an impersonal force or form or something or cause that's nothing like mm -hmm. you could actually relate to you, let alone establish a necessary or sufficient principle for you knowing. It doesn't make any sense to me. And therefore, yeah. I would um, conclude that, well, yeah, if I'm a person and knowledge seems to be personal, it seems that the cause of that um, both ontologically and epistemically would need to be personal in some way too, right? Well, do you think, I'm curious, do you think that uh, personal causes could produce non-personal effects? That, yeah, that's um, interesting. I mean, the reason why I ask that is just to kind of draw out the nature of the like principle, you know, because you, you might take a kind of strict principle that like always causes like. That's why you can't get knowledge from non-knowledge. But then it cuts both ways. You can't get non-knowledge from knowledge, let's say. Yeah. Um, isn't that kind of fall along the same principle that th they're in the effect, there's something of the cause? Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be strange if, you know, uh, causes produced effects and nothing of the cause was resembled or left in the effect. Yeah, that's a strange thought. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a good thought. I mean, it, it's I tend to think of this in terms of like, what's primary. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I have like a clean principle that cuts every case. But I find it helpful just to sort of think of some examples. Like if I throw up sa sand, I'll sometimes ask my kids like, okay, is this conscious? Like I'll point to some Legos like is this are these Legos thinking? It's like, what if we take the blue Legos or what if we stack them in this way or what if we put them into the shape of a smile, you know, mm -hmm. then do they become happy? And they have the very strong sense that shape is not sufficient for, for consciousness. Yeah. But could it go the other way? Could consciousness produce shape? And well, then, you know, th this might sound a little weird, but one thing that I've done is I've like closed my eyes and I I've tried to generate like mental images in my mind mm -hmm. through intentionality. It seems like there's some power that I have to produce something like extension or the imagery of, of shape and color. Um, it seems like there's a, there's a distinction there between generating uh, mental states that have geometry and color properties, qualitative properties I never thought about that. versus generating from qualitative properties, uh, rationality or mind. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a, there's a, there's a kind of construction problem that is, in my mind, more poignant if you try to produce happiness from string cheese versus trying to produce, let's say, a mental image of, screen, of string cheese. Um, you know, and you might think, well, your mental image of string cheese, that's not a material thing. Well, what is material? I mean, the material is what's external to you causing your mental images. And I think fundamentally my current working hypothesis follows a path that certain physicists have pointed me towards, which is that at the fundamental layer of the material world is informational states. And I, I'm inclined to just take that as, as literal, that these are informational uh, states, states of, of uh, law, states of, uh, you might say, agreement to cause X given input Y. And informational states can be a product of a mind given our own familiarity with our own minds producing informational states. So that's kind of the view that I've, I've come to that there is, there is an asymmetry between the problem of constructing 
mind from mindless matter versus constructing uh, from mind the effects that we experience. Yeah. Um, great thoughts. I haven't thought about that before. Um, yeah, it kind of cracks me up and um, hopefully we'll get to do some work um, in the future of, uh, about, you know, arguments against materialism. But it's kind of funny that if, if one identified themselves as a materialist and then kind of in the spirit that you were talking about, you ask them, well, what is, if you're a materialist and you're, you know, um, committed to, I only believe in material entities, properties, or that which could be either epistemically or causally reduced to such. Yeah. I would think you at least have to have some kind of general idea of what matter is, but what is it? Is it the thing <laughs> extended through space? Is it platonic matter, Aristotelian matter? And, um, and now you've got um, science basically saying that, well, then the further you go down, it's, um, it's nothing like matter. It's um, actually something immaterial. It makes me, in one sense, now I know there's going to be more sophisticated versions, especially when you get into like physicalism and kind of uh, having a, non, a natural uh, ontological attitude of kind of being open to a certain view of causality. But I do find it kind of funny. How am I going to take your position seriously if you if you say you're a materialist, but you can't tell me in an even very general sense what matter is? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's difficult for everybody. I mean, people say mind is a mystery. Yeah. And well, is matter not a mystery? I mean, it's like we've got matter all figured out and mind is, is the last mystery. It's like, right. I don't know. I almost feel like it could go the other way, that mind is what's most familiar mm -hmm. to you and that your own understanding of everything else, including matter, is understandable in terms of mental concepts, in terms of the concept of causation, which you witness within your own experience of yourself causing and informing that's intentions. a great point you know that david hume brings that up that if yeah um where do you see causation in the material world with experience sense experience you in a way i would say you posit it mm -hmm. based on your experience of it within um i know he had a, a difficulty suggesting or, or sort of saying that you are aware of a causal relation as such within um but then he also had a difficulty saying that he was aware of himself to which I'm thinking, come or what on, self is. come on, Hume, how come you're not aware of yourself? I'm aware of myself. Just pay attention to yourself. I think it's possible. Uh, but anyway, that's well, that's in it. one sense, given his prior commitments. Um, and that's what I like to analyze, you know, in people's philosophies and epistemologies. Are you committed to a certain idea? Ladies and gentlemen, are you committed to a certain idea that makes other ideas difficult to reconcile and think about? Probably we all are to an extent. <laughs> yeah. Then that's why we need each other to help expose that, right? Well, we've got a program for that. Yeah. And through our seven-step uh, program, we can heal you of this um, <laughs> cognitive dissonance and uh, internal contradictions so that you can think about reality in the correct way. Does um, the program turn us into presuppositionalists? I hope so. Um, because then we have to presuppose something else that we're committed to that blocks us from any kind of revision. Yeah, so just just because you're a presuppositionalist doesn't... We get into these arguments all the time with <laughs> atheists, and they're like, well, I presuppose an orange. And, right. And I'm like, <laughs> what it is about presupposing something, we hope that what we presuppose ends up, um, you know, as I always say, that gives an account for our observations. Yeah. I mean, I'd hate to be committed to an idea that's like, well, it can't really explain anything uh, that we see at all um, or how things go together. Um, but I'd also like it to be coherent. I think we all yeah. would. I don't want to have in my presupposition or stories or philosophy these kind of competing claims that I can't hold both at the same time without being inconsistent or contradicting myself. And I also hope that what we presuppose are the projects that we're committed to um, can provide um, gesticulatory for us. That... Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you, I mean, is your presuppositionalism different from a version of foundationalism? I mean, don't you have foundational items of knowledge on your view? Yeah, we would. It's, that's interesting. That's been brought up too. So I would say that 
it's not identical but it is similar it has a lot of probably more similarities with the coherentist um and epistemic holist view and then any of the variety is a foundationalism but what we've had people ask uh, but isn't that a foundation it's like yeah nobody's saying you know i'm getting away from all foundations i was in the business uh, foundation and it was bankrupt and it's just what types of foundations and how yeah. do we explain right. that um and obviously well, you i think, think coherentists uh are using coherentism is a foundation but not in the same way as the other varieties of well, that we identified as foundationalists yeah and that makes sense uh, and i was if i may kind of pursue i was kind of curious if, if do you do you think that you can have a knowledge of something without having a knowledge of god no okay that i don't so i think this is where we'll disagree so what i think this is my view and i and i'm i can be moved from my view um so I think that there are certain preconditions for knowledge. And I think one of those preconditions is a kind of rational foundation or some kind of theistic foundation. So the way I would put it is that um, if God doesn't exist or some fundamental mind didn't exist, then there would be no knowledge. But I don't think that I have to know that a fundamental mind exists for me to have knowledge. Um, so that would be a distinction that I would make. And, I'm actually kind of curious to hear a little bit more, like what would motivate that you have to know, not, not only that God has to exist for you to have knowledge, but that you have to know that God exists for you to have knowledge. Yeah. I, I mean, why, depends on why couldn't God mean. give you knowledge? Why couldn't God awaken knowledge within you of the existence of your hands without awakening first the existence of himself? I think in part, again, it depends on how you know and the, and the various mechanisms and modes in which you would know yeah but i believe that he does that and in fact going back to that demetrius stanuloy is that all men know and when we're reading the romans you know by all men i imagine that includes three-year-olds too that you know and two-year-olds that God's presence is so real that the way that we know might not be discursively. That first things first, I think it's that a good we distinction. know in a very yeah. personal and intimate and immediate way. Mm -hmm. But then in Romans, what does it say? But men suppress that knowledge. So what I believe is that it's not just simply, it's not like the internalist position, right? Where in order to know you have to have access to certain um, other uh, you have to be aware of certain beliefs that would be justifications which mm -hmm. might actually itself lead down an infinite regress whereas for example in the externalist position they would say okay if you're holding a true belief for the right reasons and that's a justification you don't necessarily have to know that that's the justification and other as long as it's a justification yeah that's so a good point i do i do appreciate that um what i would say is that we begin with knowing god from the very beginning but what happens is then we create what i call autonomous epistemologies or we end up holding other views, like Roman says, that suppresses the knowledge of God, that makes, so there are, I guess we'd both agree, there are things that we can believe in and assume or presuppose that would make knowledge impossible. And that's yeah. what I actually believe happens is that we all begin knowing God um, in a very personal, intimate and immediate way. Why? Because God is present and fills all things um, and is in the very heart of man. But what happens is that man begins to remove himself and builds um, towers of babels and idols that, okay, I'm holding to this position here where I don't need God. I can start without God. And when I analyze those, um, what some of those presuppositions or projects, what I see is that, oh, shoot that's going to make knowledge impossible not just knowledge of god 
And so we need to kind of tear down the idols and kind of return back to, and it's kind of just, you know, our history that we tend to do that. We, you know, we, we move away from God. We, we move towards ourselves and the things that we think are correct in our autonomous way. And that not only removes us from, you know, our personal and intimate relationship with God, but I'd say it causes certain epistemic problems that make knowledge itself impossible. Mm -hmm. I liked your distinction between a kind of knowledge that's like explicit and conceptual. This is how I was understanding you versus a kind of maybe implicit knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about my own children. When they were born, they began to know us. But the concepts they had to even understand their experience with us, they wouldn't articulate it in the form of, I know that my dad exists or something like that, right? Right, yeah. Or give you and a cosmological argument for that's the, right. the existence of dad. It's more just knowledge by acquaintance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess the view that I've come to is that you can be acquainted with, even if it's um, God, you can be acquainted with aspects of God without also being acquainted with any kind of proposition that God exists. You can be acquainted yes. with aspects of God with, and the aspects of God it aren't even the same as God. So for example, let's say that one of the aspects of God is some kind of, um, I don't know, this isn't necessarily my view, but let's just play with this. Let's, let's say that God intends that massive bodies attract and that this intention in God's mind is the law of gravity. Mm -hmm. And that when you come to know and be acquainted with this uh, intention, you're actually acquainted with some aspect of God, but that intention isn't the same thing as God. God is the one who forms that intention so that you can actually have knowledge of something that isn't God. It's his intention. So you're going to love that you got to read. I'll have to send you some stuff on the essence energies. Yeah. So what God is, is his essence. And we all know that I think most Christians would say that um, that is unknown. Um, nobody can see my face and live as God says to Moses um, going to Mount Sinai. This is interesting. So your view is that nobody knows God's essence. Yes. But everybody knows God in some other respect. Yeah. And so what we would say is that God, and this is only present in Eastern Orthodoxy. So typically when we get in arguments with Roman Catholics, this, this becomes, especially because they're committed to absolute divine simplicity, this becomes a, a real issue as far as how God relates to the world, how we can know him. Um, and this is a lot of my critiques are kind of out of this, but the energies are that they really are God. The distinction is they're not God's essence. They're what God does. And what God does is eternal. And so in some sense, it's God's essence. It's who God is and what God is outside of himself versus the inner um, recesses is, as uh, St. Timothy in, in Scripture says, um, hidden you know, and uh, in, a, in darkness that we, we can never see that. But what's nice about that is that the energy, it comes from the Greek word energeia, uh, operations, activities. Um, they really are God and they're what can be known. But these exist before the foundations of all of creation. Mm -hmm. God is eternal and what he and sometimes they're likened to um, the archetypes so there is an idea or archetype of you is it identical with God's essence no mm -hmm. um, but it's eternal it's God outside of himself it's not created but then God's free will what they call thought wills he wills this the intention to be and his will is so true that it actually creates the being of you on the kind mm -hmm. of the, the archetype um, of and so what this gives you is and we'd also say that god is fully present in each and every one of those 
um, energies or activities or operations, pre-eternal. And what this gives you is a continuity between God's thoughts before the foundations of all his energies, his logoi, and creation itself, in which yeah. he's not only transcendent, but he's present. And so those can be known, like you said, God can be known because he's fully present in his person and his essence, even though we don't know his essence, in yeah. each and every one of his activities. Okay. And his though all of nature is based in that and participates in that and it only has as saint paul says we live and move and have our being in him he's speaking about the divine energies and so we can know god directly and immediately because he's present fully and it's not just parts of it and i don't have to to know god to work out these philosophical arguments and do discursive reason go through the propositions yeah, um, and I'd I'd probably say that's not really the way that you know um, God or persons. Can you imagine if we did this to our wives? Well, the way that I know you is because I just crunched you through this deductive argument, sweetheart, and uh, it just showed me that. <laughs> well, I will say when I met my wife Rachel, I was so enamored. I thought this was early on, like after a few weeks of meeting her. I thought either this is the one I'm going to marry, or she's a product of aliens. It's a holographic <laughs> image. I literally had this thought in my mind. And well, I guess I've had some evidence that supports a certain hypothesis, but I mean, yeah, it's hard to really rule it out, right? I mean, <laughs> I just plugged her into the disjunctive. She's either either a creation of the evil demon robot, or uh, or a good real. demon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's real. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's really what I think is that later on in life we end up forming theories about the world, ourselves, um, and knowledge itself that are not justified and that would in fact make knowledge impossible. So after the fact, I feel like I got to come in. It's like, you know, God in the most inner recesses, but you, you suppress that knowledge. And what I want to, what the kind of presuppositional argument is from the Orthodox point of view, is to tear down those strongholds and show without God. So it's not that you have to presuppose them in a discursive, you already do. But now that you suppress that, you make the enterprise of knowledge impossible. Um, and so I can give a sort of argument that you need to return home um, in order to have any knowledge meaning um, and knowledge of God is kind of what, so it's, I believe we already know it. We commit ourselves to certain projects and ideas that would make knowing impossible. And that part of what a transcendental argument is to show or presuppositional is that on your view, it makes knowledge impossible. And so you can't then just go turn around and go, well, I've got an argument against God. Well, if you don't have a sufficient argument for arguments, there's no argument for God. Mm. Um, so really, I think it's just the gospel. I think it's less, you know, if we, if we think of it as kind of, it could be a, a type of argument, but not in the traditional sense. And I'd even say that it's not even a transcendental argument necessarily in the Kantian sense, because you could have three different types of arguments, a deductive, inductive, or mm -hmm. a, like a, a transcendental argument as Kant lays out, I would say it's simply the gospel that we're taking captive every thought and making it obedient to Christ and tearing down arguments and strongholds. So it's really the gospel. Now I can then put that into what's called a transcendental argument. But, and this will probably get into a conversation about, I wanna know if first things first, uh, what would make knowledge impossible and what would be the necessary conditions to have knowledge? Mm -hmm. And would we be involved as the classical foundationalists are already appreciated? Well, what if we just have an infinite regress of reasons for reasons for reasons? Could you actually ever say that you were justified 
or have knowledge. And I, I don't think so. I think we all agree that it's like, yeah, that would be a problem. But what if something was viciously circular that it's a, or simply um, ad hoc, it's a justification because I say it's a justification. So those are the kind of things that motivate me in thinking about the various um, epistemologies is that, yeah. well, what is justification? How would we know that? Um, and me being committed to, and we all are, we all presuppose different things and committed to, would that make my project or the possibility of saying, affirming that we could have knowledge, even a modest version, would that make it impossible? So that, that's mm -hmm. what I'm kind of curious about. Yeah, well, and that's very helpful. I like how you put that. I would want to maybe separate two projects. So one project is kind of like, what are the conditions for knowledge? Um, included in that project would be seeing whether an atheist, uh, let me put it this way, whether atheism um, could allow for knowledge. All right, so that would be like one project. Mm -hmm. And I think that you and I have a lot of resonance with respect to um, there, there needs to be some kind of rational structure or foundation for there to be knowledge. Um, the other project would be the project of kind of figuring out whether somebody who is an atheist could have knowledge. So that's different than the project of figuring out whether atheism is consistent with knowledge. It's whether you have to actually have a, a, a belief in God or knowledge of God to know anything. And then within this project, I'm actually just very, very curious to explore this a little bit with you because it sounded like you were saying that everybody actually does have knowledge of God, not in his essence, but in his effects. And since God is in some significant way, let's say in all of his effects, everybody has, there's some sense in which everybody has knowledge of God. And so then I'm thinking, okay, well then maybe there's another sense in which uh, somebody could claim to not have knowledge of God, maybe it would be sort of this propositional knowledge. So let's say that I, I'm going to just assume your view is correct. Um, I've got knowledge of God, but I say to you that I don't have the knowledge that God exists. And what I thought you might be suggesting is that um, the reason that I would come to the Okay, I guess there's a few different things. Mm -hmm. First, let me just ask you, do you think that I could have the knowledge that I have hands, given that I do have the knowledge of God on your view, even while I also uh, say that I, I don't have the knowledge that God exists? Does that make sense? So, so I guess what I'm trying to do yeah, is... Yeah, I don't know how we flesh that out, that because... So let's say there's so, a propositional well, how did, knowledge. How did you, you had, yeah, that. Um, and a non propositional knowledge. Yeah, so. Like, and everybody has the non propositional, the sort of preconceptual knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we could suppress that, but we could, it never goes away. Right. And I thought, this is what I thought you were kind of suggesting mm -hmm. is that in ev evidence that you're suppressing it is that you don't arrive at the kind of propositional knowledge of God. That, so we all have the non propositional knowledge. And then as long as we don't suppress that, we'll sort of automatically arrive at the propositional knowledge. Is that kind of a way of... Yeah, I would think that um, in a similar vein that uh, varieties of sense datum theorists or foundationalists would argue that, for example, um, the, the apple is appearing red to me. Mm -hmm. is my experience. And so what do they say? Well, that's just phenomenologically simple. And there's a sort of a median sort of knowledge by acquaintance that yeah. you get that if that is actually a justification, then I can have what's called a basic belief that's justified. Yeah. Such that there's a sort of entailment that say, well, then I'm justified in making the uh, belief or, and furthermore, um, a proposition, um, it's appearing red to me. I would think the same with, with, with God, right? That there's sort of kind of an immediacy that you know of which you should be able to then, I mean, if you can formulate propositions, be able to say that um, in a propositional form. 
But the problem is, well, what if I commit myself to other propositions that make that impossible or something? That's kind of what I'm I'm Yeah, and then you kind of defeat your own knowledge. It would be sort of like if if you had the belief that your brain was hooked up to a machine and there was a mad scientist, no, a mad philosopher typing into the machine all your beliefs Mm -hmm. and you see them type into the machine you shall believe your name is, you shall believe your name is Josh, you know, and then you have that belief. But given your belief that your beliefs are produced by this mad philosopher, that very belief sort of undercuts the justification of all of your beliefs. Even the belief about the mad philosopher, everything gets undercut. Yeah, so we're not, and we're not ever going to find somebody. It's like, here is the um, beliefless man. Um, he's formed no propositions and... Um, we're not going to counter that. And so what I'm thinking is that that's eventually why I actually have to present kind of presuppositional and transcendental arguments is that I want to say that you already knew this, but now you're committed to other ideas um, such that if I can't get you to then recognize and affirm the, the epistemic starting point, in propositional form, then I'm going to say you're not in a position to know anything and make any knowledge claims. That's that's what I'd argue. So, yeah, that's um, I'm not sure then because of the other propositions and beliefs that people are committed to that they do know that because I do believe that they do suppress that. And so I'm not, I don't think I would agree that a person can um, actually know that they, there's a hand in these various things because they've already committed themselves to uh, mutually exclusive beliefs. What if it was kind of like a knowledge by acquaintance? So I will just kind of tell you what it was like to be me when I found myself without belief in God um, I was thinking about whether God exists and, you know, maybe there's a sense in which I was acquainted with God, but didn't know it. Um, you know, did, what, did I have no acquaintance with anything? Did I not know that I was even having questions about God? I mean, it seems like just for me experientially and kind of what it was like to arrive at belief in God was discovery of chains of reason that led me to arrive at, okay, God exists. Now, maybe in your terms, I already knew God sort of in a non-conceptual way, but I didn't have the sort of conceptual knowledge of that. Was I suppressing it? Well, it didn't feel like I was trying to, I mean, you know, maybe suppressing in some way I didn't understand. I mean, I didn't feel like I was trying to suppress it. Um, In fact, I will say that it was through this experience that I felt like I don't know. I felt like I, I could have a kind of friendship and an understanding of others who have a similar journey where they are just trying to find out what's true and they're doing their best, you know, and um, maybe they're failing in ways that are outside of their understanding. Uh, but for me, it, it just, it felt like the journey to arriving at a theistic belief wasn't from just sort of recognizing an internal awareness uh, in fact, even to this day, why do you think that is? That's interesting. Well, even to this day, I mean, it, it, even to the sense that to, even to the, even when I consider if I'm internally aware of God and there are moments where I feel like I'm in connection with God and I feel like I can hear God's voice and I get ideas and inspiration as it happens, especially in the context of worship. Um, I'll ask God questions and I feel like I'm in connection with God, but I still would wonder, well, why think that that's even from God rather than from my own mind or my own consciousness? Maybe it's just like a dream or a hallucination. That's what I think is the kind of suppression is that there's certain things that, because I was just thinking when you were speaking of, um, you know, having a child before they can start articulating things and propositions, they have, I would say they have a knowledge of you personally um, in a sort of immediacy and that um, Ceteris Paribus and as 
you know, as long as there's not any kind of obstacles or something like that, when they're capable of putting something into things into propositions, then they should be able to affirm unless otherwise, unless there something prevents that. Um, because that seems like a very natural process is first we have this kind of immediacy and um, let's say you're justified in knowing that is kind of acquaintance that as soon as you develop the capacity to put that in words, you should be able to, because that immediacy is kind of, once you put that in proposition, just simply say, here it is. Here's my dad. I don't know all the various things about, you know, dad or something like that. But shouldn't the child be able to, once they're able to put things in propositions, affirm what they've already known and always known? That this is this is dad. The fact that the proposition or the content that the proposition is attempting to express, unless there's a problem. Yeah. Well, so there's. I'm I'm hesitating because I see sort of two axes of considerations. One is about the relationship between the proposition and the sort of non-conceptual awareness, and there's a set of issues there. Um, but then there's this other axis with respect to it, it's it has to do with okay even if there's a kind of natural fit between the propositions and the non-conceptual awareness i think you're probably right that things can get in the way i mean so um in my case i had questions about animal suffering um also about sort of the nature of religion and how it arises uh the the, the diversity of religions and it was like like there was enough there were enough considerations that um, put me into a place that I couldn't just believe that any kind of internal connection with source or a mind uh, was veridical. Uh, so maybe this would be like if the child encounters other people at school saying, "Oh, these aren't actually your parents." Like. You were stolen from this camp, you know, and sounds like and, something and, a sibling would say. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you, you could tell a story where, you know, there are other conditions that cause the child to now need something else than just an immediate experience. There's also that other axis, like I'm not really sure that it's part of the content of the experience that it's well, it depends on the experience, right? So and each person has different experiences and, and I have to consider the different experiences that I've had. I mean, I have had the experience of having this sense of being in connection with another. Um, and so maybe it's sort of like a dream where now I can entertain the possibility that it's just a dream. I can entertain the possibility right now that I'm in the matrix and they're, you know, you're not actually real or something. Um, but I don't, so I, I like how you put it. I mean, in a way, I wouldn't have a doubt about the existence of other people unless there's something that's sort of gotten in the way. Yeah. To be honest, I hesitate to sort of say that it's always because of a kind of active suppression. I mean, goodness, I mean, we're in a fallen world, like things get in the way for people. And I don't know if, if somebody came along and told me, you're just suppressing the knowledge of God, like you need to stop yeah, that. I don't, I don't necessarily mean that like, and I'm, I'm not trying to give you a hard time here. I, I'm just, that it's like I may even just think about, about like there's probably people in your audience who who maybe they are they can relate to the journey you know so I feel like maybe there are different people and they need almost like different messages depending on where they're at Let's but I imagine to, there are people yeah. who can relate to this journey of really wanting to know God and just not finding a way and the way through reason is a way that makes it possible for them maybe it's a way to kind of help alleviate a concern that you have. Because one of your concerns is you don't want to build belief on a faulty path, but maybe what the way of reason can do it, is it can actually restore your confidence in a more direct, in, in a direct intimate relationship. It's well, like a way of saying that the skeptical worries um, don't go through. You know, you, you did say we live in a fallen world and I probably should just take a few minutes to talk about like um, the orthodox epistemology is that um, because of the fallen world and various things that we might do intentionally or unintentionally, it doesn't allow us to see things correctly, um, let alone God. And for 
orthodoxy, it's kind of reversed from, I guess, the kind of scholasticism um, in Roman Catholicism, things like that. The way to knowledge is repentance, metonia. It's a changing of the mind and the way of, and the only way to actually, and it's very incarnational. So rather than putting the kind of reason and propositions first, it's like what you said, it's the person first and an acknowledgement that I have to repent um, because the mistakes I'm doing aren't just affecting my character and who I am, but how I see the world. And that's inevitably kind of caught up and various ideas that we, and I'd like to talk about this too, because something that you said that, you know, before we have this kind of um, conceptual awareness, we have this kind of immediacy, it made me think about, you know, Seller's attack on the myth of the given. And I think perhaps there's a few things that we could draw out of Seller's critique that might be fruitful. Um, his critique of the myth of the given is that there is any such thing. And I imagine, obviously, we're not going to use like the infant or something like that. But perhaps even at the infant, this bears somewhat. Um, but that there's these ideas that there's semantic givens or those experiences uh, that and I guess givens could refer to anything, um, let's say, immediate experiences. Let me see where I have the... The sort of non-conceptual content yeah, of your it experience. Could be, it could be like first principles. Yeah. It could be um, sensings. Where's my sellers here? I've got this up. See, I think the only myth is that these things are universal. But I think it's absolutely true that you can be acquainted with realities in a basic way. And then what's given to you is something. Uh, I understand that you conceptualize it. So there's an activity that's part of that. So in that sense, um, I don't think you have a sort of purely unconceptualizable mm -hmm. uh, basis for thought, but that there actually is something that you can be non-conceptually aware of from which you can conceptualize. Yeah, explain that. That's interesting. That's kind of puzzling to me. Well, I, I might put it in terms of awareness with the divine nature. I mean, let's say that I'm in connection with God and I'm thinking about that connection. I think that there's a kind of basic relation of acquaintance. Uh, Richard Fumerton talks about this, this kind of direct acquaintance at the foundation of knowledge. Maybe this is knowledge. It's the basic knowledge. Or it's a kind of knowledge. Um, it's hard to say more. I mean, it's it's like you just witness it within yourself. When you're having a thought, you can be aware that you're having that thought. Not does it having. Does it um, give you pause that in order to express that, we already put it in concept, um, in thought. It gives me pause because there is this kind of Solar's leap. Uh, the Salarzian dilemma, which is the dilemma related to how your conceptual, your, your sort of first conceptual thing, call that a thought, is related to a non-conceptual thing. Right. And I think ultimately there's a kind of just basic relation. Um, I have some ideas about how that might work. Not yeah, how quite sure what I to say. I was curious, like, how we justify that. I'm so I, I have this theory of arrangements in my book on truth, and it's about the relationship between conceptual things and non-conceptual things. So an example that I give is a relationship between, let's say, a proposition and then what that proposition is about. So let's say the proposition that snow is white mm -hmm. and then snow's being white. And the theory that I give there is that snow's being white is a kind of structure that relates snow, exemplification, and whiteness. And then the proposition that snow is white is another kind of structure that relate, relates an essence of snow with an essence of whiteness and a kind of corresponding relation. And then the proposition that snow is white corresponds to the structure of snow being white, 
when the properties contained in the abstract structure, the proposition, are exemplified by the concrete structure. And this gives us the relation of correspondence. And then the idea here is that a, a, a being like you, you're a being, <laughs> being is capable of being aware, directly acquainted with the proposition, the structure and the correspondence between them. And that's where you get your concept of truth because you get the concept of a thought being true as in matching with reality. And so given that there are clear cases of this, then you have concepts, the concept of truth, the concept of thought. And again, this is all based on direct acquaintance. So and then you can for other if, things. What if somebody said, I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah. What if somebody said, so those direct experiences, what you told me about those direct experiences um, and then how we later relate that conceptually is true if what you're saying about how that works is true. And then let's suppose somebody says, but doesn't either isn't that viciously circular um, or gets you into the exact thing you wanted to avoid uh, trying to get out of the conceptual sphere. So you're relating because it's, it's true if and only if that actually, so the story is true about that. Um, and but I don't have, have to like, know that. So I think you're right. It is true if and only if the story is true, but I don't have to know the story to know it. So I'm a particularist in the Chisholm sense that you start with items of knowledge and then you build your knowledge of the theories of those items of knowledge secondarily. So you don't have to start with how you know to know. Um, and I think even a presuppositionalist would say that you start with the knowledge of God and you build your knowledge elsewhere. I mean, in a way, maybe the difference between your view and my view is that your view is a pyramid with a single point, knowledge of God, from which everything else comes. Maybe. I'm not sure. Um, whereas on my view, I would say that God's existence is a precondition for knowledge, but that the knowledge of God, I'm not seeing that I have to know that God exists, except in some maybe non-conceptual way where I don't know that I know. Um, but no, actually, I don't. I mean, I guess if I'm really honest with myself, my current view right now is that I can know things by acquaintance and I don't have to know that God exists by acquaintance to know other things. Even if in fact, every being knows that God exists by acquaintance, that knowledge by acquaintance of God is not required to have knowledge by acquaintance of other things. It seems but to me. Wouldn't somebody say, well, dang it, that just gets us back into the infinite regress as far as justifications. That... These are foundations. The, the acquaintance is the foundation. So, so, so one, the... yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that, that's it. Yeah, go ahead. So some might say that, um, sure, that's true if that's um, if that's a foundation and it's a justification. And sure, it may be true that I might not have to know of that. But now we're doing a meta level analysis, but I don't know that's a justification. So it isn't. I mean, the meta analysis isn't part of the justification. And if I can't know something's actual justification and the story is true, then how can I say that it's a justification? So I'm either, it seems like the critique would be, well, shoot, I'm either back viciously circular, I'm assuming what I want to prove, or I'd be down the road of trying to give a justification for a justification of justification. So maybe not everybody needs to know that, but if we're making claims about what justifications are, don't we need to be in that position to be able to justify that as a justification? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I would say that I'm also aware of my awareness. And so the way that I arrive at my view is I just notice a lot of things that I believe. And I trace those beliefs back to basic beliefs that it looks like I'm aware uh, of my awareness mm -hmm. of the grounds. And so then I come up with a theory that explains all of these individual acts of awareness and then the theory that my current working model is that knowledge then bottoms out in basic items of knowledge which are based in basic acts of awareness um, i'm open though to other ways of analyzing those foundations whether it's 
a, a proper function in the way that Plantinga describes or reliableist way or a kind of internalist sense of the divine um, in the case of the knowledge of God, if that's basic. So I'm actually kind of flexible about how to understand those foundations. But I mean, like I think like everybody is going to have to have some answer. I mean, if, if you say that there's a knowledge of God that's based not on other knowledge, right? Maybe it's based on God, but it's not based on other knowledge. Then that knowledge of God is itself basic. And then I could ask you, well, how do you justify that that is knowledge of God? Yeah, this is what right. I, yeah, this is yeah. what I'd argue is that I try to make it into a disjunction that I think that you either have an epistemological project that we're talking about that's autonomous. Um, and what do I mean by that? That only referring to my own sphere of reasoning or the world that I actually am trying to find the criteria for my justification criteria yeah. ends up becoming impossible. And so um, the other one would be, and I would call that an autonomous um, epistemological project. The other one would be a theonomous. And what I think that is, is a recognition that I'm unable to do the project simply referring either to the world or locked within my own sphere of reasoning without an acknowledgement um, of, you know, first things first as a first epistemic principle of assuming the project becomes impossible. Um, so, and that's what I'd like to show is that those are autonomous epistemological projects in which something's either is given um, epistemic priority or an assumption that's not um, justified. And so you never really get, it seems to me that either in those epistemological projects that either you're involved in vicious circularity or an infinite regress problem that makes being able to locate any criteria for your justification criteria possible. And so the other option is a surrender that, and you know, scripture talks about this too. God will humble um, him who exalts himself and he will exalt him who humbles. And that's why I think that, and I think you've already agreed with this knowledge and the foundations of knowledge is less to do with kind of discursive reasoning and propositions and is more of a personal and relational way. How are you oriented to the thing that perhaps is apophatic and you cannot express even before you have? And there's all kinds of different things that we do that might disrupt that relationship or even ruin it such that I'm now on my own and I can't actually explain things. And this is why that, you know, both in scripture and the church fathers talk about to see things as they truly are and to understand both man, yourself, nature, and God, you must properly reorientate yourself towards the kind of necessary condition. That doesn't have to be propositional. We could express it that way. But I really think it's more of an ontological and personal mm -hmm. way of, and so I'd say that, look, that's the kind of, if you could call it an argument, the kind of argument that that I want to say is that you can't do it by yourself. That if you try to just use starting points, the world or your own mind, um, you never are able to solve that problem and actually provide a, a justification for your justification criteria. And so that God really is proven not as the conclusion of any rational or empirical theistic arguments but the very ground of argument itself. And you're really surrendering yourself. You're, that's the metanoia. That's the repentance. I'm mm -hmm. surrendering things to God's view rather than my own, that I can start with myself and figure this stuff out. Um, in order to, and then once you do that, you can then come back and be able to give a kind of articulate, a coherent theory of, of knowledge, um, such that God's 
And I would say that's through God's revelation in the, in the, the very sense that we talked about. But his revelation, I would say, is not validated by our epistemology um, or our own sphere of reasoning. But I would say our epistemology is validated by the revelation of God and the story that's contained in the revelation. Um, that's kind of what I want to, to argue. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of that verse, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, yeah, wisdom. Yeah. And, I, and what I hear you saying is there's a kind of attitude of humility. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really do think kind of the more that I embark in the, in the philosophical project that those intellectual virtues of humility and curiosity and um, in the spiritual context, the sort of calling for help uh, really do help you to get to knowledge. Um, yeah, you're so, sorry, you, know, it, you said that in the beginning too. That's really yeah, you yeah. Know, so it's, it's really interesting. I mean, you really actually helps us see things <laughs> correctly. You, 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 yeah, you triggered a thought. I've, I've actually never had this thought before when you were talking about repentance because <laughs> now I this thought might not be sort of what you were expecting me to think, but I was going back to that time when I wasn't sure what to think about the world with respect to God or whatever. And I remember having a thought at that time that God would rather me be an atheist and be intellectually honest than just like have faith and try to believe something that I couldn't honestly see as true. And it's, it's interesting because I remember before that experience, I had, um, it's almost like maybe I thought of arguments as devices to sort of can control people and, and, and sort of bring them into my view. And in, a, in an interesting, you, you weird too. way, I, <laughs> what, what's that? You too? <laughs> yeah, well, I was gonna say in a weird way, I almost feel like you, you are actually saying the very same thing that um, I ended up experiencing, which was a, a kind of, let's see how I can put this. Um, a, a repentance from a using of reason to control people and to fortify my position. And then you talked about a surrender. It's almost like I surrendered to reality in a sense. And it was like, I just want to know what's actually true. And, and in a weird way, it was almost like that was the the ticket to real salvation, if I could use the word, or, or freedom, because it was like through that path that, well, it, my experience of it was that the Lord led me along a particular set of steps unique to my own journey of uh, reason, putting light on certain steps. I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about this because I almost feel like there was a kind of form of repentance, mm -hmm. but it wasn't of the form, like, I'm sorry for suppressing the knowledge of you. Mm -hmm. It was, it was different, but it was almost like that was part of my journey. And it was actually part of what led me into, I would say, a greater understanding of God and of reality. Yeah. I so have, it's just, it's interesting. I had a it's similar experience too. And I mean, Perhaps we could say this just like philosophically that uh, what do they say that do you remember this in grad school you could tell a difference between a master's and a PhD student the master's student thought they had it all figured out and would give you whatever answer and the PhD if you asked a PhD student they'd be like I don't know I don't know anything anymore just gotta <laughs> get this dissertation passed like don't talk to me you just interrupted my thought I don't even know where I'm at anymore um, and I saw sort of pride in kind of, um, let's say it could be just be undergrads too. I always tell people one of the worst and most dangerous things you could do is take a philosophy class or two. Um, and the way to, to fix that is take six, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But, um, there's a, you s immediately see the difference between the kind of pride and trust in oneself and their own thoughts um, with the very little knowledge that they have and then being exposed, you know, to more and more difficult ideas and this sort of kind of humility. 
but with my own experience going through that process and many other things, I began to lose trust in my own abilities to figure stuff out and my own arguments. Um, but in turn, and I think that's a type of humility yeah. is that, you know what? I thought I knew what was going on. Um, I've gotten a lot more information and I really don't. And I don't want to be put in a position to actually have to tell people how it is. Yeah. And that's terrible because I don't think I know what I'm doing. But at yeah. that point, then you begin to, the obstacles are cleared and you get to see, you know, things more correctly. And I really think mm -hmm. it's like that verse that because it's no longer you doing it, you're now switching. And I was thinking about this too, that it's all about your orientation and view. Because if you think about when the angels were created and Lucifer was the highest created angel, his eyes were cast and he was beholding the splendor of the uncreated um, trinity. Um, but Lucifer was the most beautiful and creative of all beings. And he began to, there was no mechanism or cause, he had his free will, so he had the ability to cast his eyes off of the beauty of the Holy Trinity, the uncreated light. And he looked at himself and he found that he was beautiful because he was beautiful. And here begins the story of the separation and the, the, the changing of orientation. Um, and that was the fall. And you begin to get enamored. And I think that something like that happens within all of us too, is we begin with our eyes beholding the splendor of the Holy Trinity and all its beauty. And we began to, you know, for various reasons, um, to look at ourselves and to think about our own ideas. And we become enamored with, <laughs> well, Deacon, that was an excellent argument. One of the best arguments I've ever heard in my life, you know, and I don't think anybody could have a better argument than that. And what happens? Your eyes are off of God now. And you begin to not see things correctly because you're blinded by, you know, we talked about that kind of echo chamber and stuff like that. But the reorientation is an internal thing where, and it's mysterious, I don't know exactly how it works, but to be able to give up on one's own view of oneself in the world and mm -hmm. go, I don't know what's going on. And at yeah. that point, God begins to give the light again and allows you to see reality correctly. I really think, and I can use my various philosophy and you know discursive arguments and propositions and stuff like that to try to express that. Yeah. Um, that's really what my project is, but it really yeah, has I nothing to that. do with yeah. the proposition. It really has to do with that relationship. Yeah. Are you looking at yourself and your own ideas? Are you lifting yourself up? Or are you humbling yourself? And if you humble yourself, the light of God will bring you back up and he will allow you to see himself in the world correctly. I love that. And, and, and even when you look at yourself and you see greatness there, you recognize that you didn't make your own greatness and that your greatness um, is special and is something that you can use to serve others. Yeah. You By know? the way, that's and a I, temptation I, all the time. I don't know if you get this, but um, I know the demon well now. Um, I, I can call him by name, but I feel like any time that I do anything that's good, I get the voice in like, well done, way to go. Really climbing up the ladder on this one. You're really going to become, I'm like, oh, I know this voice. I'm like, Are you sure that's a demon? I mean, you know, God could also cheer you on. I tell my kids, well done all the time. Yeah, but it's, it's different. You like, different. it's, uh, it's, you'll know it by its fruit. There's no shame in knowing your, well, so I, I think that. I've often told people that I think wisdom comes through tension. And I think there is this interesting tension between being humble and then recognizing the greatness of God's creation, which includes you. Mm -hmm. And and I see how it's, it's interesting because I see how sometimes I think when people draw attention to themselves, it's actually because they don't see their own greatness that they oh, need yeah, others absolutely. to tell them how great they are. Yeah. You By know, way, so it, it's interesting. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, here's how I tell the difference where it's coming from. 
the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh -huh. And I'm like, that's yeah. what I am. I'm a servant. The other one says, well done. You did it. You are doing it. Um, that's immediately how I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, one brings me back to, that's all I am. I'm a servant. Um, and I'm working. I'm a fellow worker in God's garden. Yeah. The other one is there is no God's guard and look what you did. It's it's a losing that's how I know. It's losing sight of God. So in that yeah. latter story, I don't hear about God. The other one it does, and I'm in a proper submission. So it's not that you can't feel good about yourself, but you feel good about yourself in the right way, in the right context, in which God is the center of the story and you mm -hmm. are the fellow worker and servant of both God and your neighbor. Yeah. Well, and I think even, you know, as, as you said, people can apprehend the effects of God without recognizing them as God. And I think that there are people who maybe they don't recognize um, the light of reason as coming from God, but the light of reason is a kind of eternal guide for them. And that in that way, they're actually fulfilling a great purpose on the earth by, um, carrying a kind of humility before something that's greater than themselves or that transcends themselves. At least what I hear you saying is something that I think is very widely applicable to people because it draws attention to the sort of duality between the transcendent and the sort of individual. And that when you can sort of humble yourself before the transcendent, then you as an individual end up experiencing more of your own greatness, even as you serve others and help them in their in their journey. Mm -hmm. Let's see, what other arguments should we... Oh, I was curious, maybe you can help me out with if we changed gears here. And, and let me know any time that you need to leave. Let's see, how long have we been? I think I've got about 10 minutes. Okay, real quick, I'll do these really oh. complicated arguments and you okay. tell me. Um, no, I'm interested in, so if we shift gears, I mean, ultimately it's related and by the way, before we get to the end, we have to reveal to your audience how this appeared, how I got this wound. Oh, so this yeah. will keep your audience on for another 10 well, minutes. Well, because we'll Josh, reveal and this got, at the end. Josh and I got in a, a pretty serious argument before this and um, I came over and I lost and I, and I hit him. <laughs> <laughs> no, how did that? Were you playing hockey? No, I sneezed and I went like this and I just oh. hit my head on the kitchen sink. Very embarrassing. <laughs> it wasn't the chair, was it? That said uh, the chair of philosophy? No, it wasn't the armchair. Yeah, um, armchair. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Taking armchair philosophy to a new level. That's funny. Um, All right, while you're while you're bringing up your argument, before our show, I, I said that I had an argument that I was going to share. I'm going to just oh, share please, it quickly. Please, please do Put it on the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the argument is this, because we've been talking about how you know things and knowledge involves reasoning and, and you've expressed the sort of problem with completely autonomous reasoning. So anyway, so here's my argument. Premise one, reasoning exists or there is reasoning or people reason. So I'm thinking that a lot of people would be happy with that premise. Uh, it's hard to find a premise that is sort of universal. Unless right? but, they're I mean, an unreasonable person. Right. <laughs> well, they might still recognize that other people are reasonable. Um, premise two, um, if, the world were my, fundamentally mindless matter, there would be no reasoning. Therefore, the world is not fundamentally mindless matter. And we could talk about both those premises. We've already kind of um, talked about them, but I just wanted to present that as an outline of an argument. And that second premise there, uh, supports for it would come from arguments from fine tuning that a random arbitrary universe actually probably wouldn't produce any uh, mm -hmm. biological organisms without certain fine tuning, an argument from consciousness, an argument from reason, an argument from this sort of construction problem of, of building the, the rational from the non-rational. And so these arguments could be supports for that second premise. So this, it seems like a kind of a type of transcendental argument from reason. Uh, I yeah, sure. That. Yeah. Except that I'm not presupposing the knowledge of God in the argument. So I'm thinking that somebody who maybe they have non-conceptual knowledge of God, but they don't claim any kind of conceptual knowledge of God. They could independently find the premises plausible. And by the way, I've met materialists who found that second premise 
plausible, the premise that without a fundamental mind, there would be no reasoning. And, um, and so we're skeptical of the existence of, of reasoning. And by the way, I think that's great. So you put it in that a modus ponens, right? If, if I think it's modus tollens. Modus tollens. Um, um, one so, of those. You can put it in modus ponens. Um, yeah, it would still work. Yeah. Um, so I would say that I... So I guess it depends on what you think a, a presuppositional argument is. Um, but that is a type of transcendental argument in which the existence of... Um, what that deductive argument does, uh, if it was the modus tollens or modus ponens, shows um, recursively is that, well, then God would be the necessary condition for um, reason. It. Yeah, that's it. For, for even the possibility of reason. So I don't have any problems with that, that yeah. we can actually take something. That, yeah, I think that's um, a point of unity between us. Yeah, like yeah. Law, look, we believe in logic um reason and then um you know and then show what would be the if logic and reason um then God, logic and reason exist yeah you can put it that way reason. if logic and re yeah that's the modus ponens form that's a very yeah, direct so the form. modus tollens yeah. was the how did you phrase yours again it with um if fundamental real if reality were fundamentally mindless then there would be no reasoning yeah there is reasoning there is reasoning therefore f reality isn't fundamentally mindless yes um I, one other thing we didn't talk about, though, too, is that, and you'll see this, I'll just end real quick with this, and then if you, if anybody had any questions in the, in the chats, we could, because we have about four minutes. Um, one of the problems that I think that's, uh, that I noticed that developed in, you know, Roman Catholicism in the West was kind of embracing uh, the Greek arguments, um, like you find in Aristotle, um, and various other, you know, maybe platonic arguments for God, but it gets you a Greek God. It's this impersonal kind of monad, um, or conclusions about like um, God is an essence that's pure actuality and being, and it's identical. But then when I read the Fathers, they never start with philosophy first, and we call this the Ordo Theologiae. They always start with persons first rather than essence, and they always seem to have started with the revelation, the story contained within that, and then ex they were free to, they were not only able, capable of justifying knowledge and philosophy, they were free to, now they have the standard, and they were free to look at the various philosophies and pull from when they saw that they were true. And my worry would be that um, historically played out. I don't want somebody to try to shove their theology into a philosophical paradigm. It's the wrong order um, that we must start with the revelation and that first um, to validate any sort of knowledge. And then we're free to, once we have the standard, to be able to. But my concern is that... How do you know which standard is the right standard? That's, that's part of the... Um, the analysis that that I actually like to do. So, for example, you could just start with, um, like I would say that, well, for example, if you're committed to certain ideas, either philosophically or about God, that would make knowledge impossible, then just on your own intuitions, you probably shouldn't hold that, right? Uh-huh. Like if yeah. God is an impersonal force, um, then how do we get ever get knowledge? Like how does God ever ever relate? If God is a, you know, an absolute divine, simple essence locked in, and He's just mediated th to the world through causes and effects, a chain of them, um, how does what unconditioned, um, uncreated being relate to conditioned circumscribed being we have a like something mm -hmm. similar to those would be kind of considerations that i would yeah. go through that's that um well it seems to me that you're committing to certain ideas or projects that would make the project excel uh, impossible mm -hmm. even on your own grounds 
Because yeah. I think people want to be like, well, yeah, I want to make sure that my story is not incoherent. Yeah. I want it to explain stuff, right? But then if you're able to point, I guess it's the way we would do anything in philosophy. Everybody yeah. wants that, but then what do we critique a, a person's position or philosophy? But going, yeah, but you're, you say that, but at the same time, then you actually commit the same thing that you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a problem? And if they're honest, they'll be like, oh, shoot, yeah, I need to go rethink that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I don't... I if they're honest believe... and they see mm-hmm. that, if they agree that that's the case, they yeah, might not see they might disagree. They might have reasons not to. So, yeah, that would be my concern, is that, like, St. Basil says that... Um, it's impossible to conceive of God apart from Trinity. That you'd say that you're talking about something else. That that's the starting point. That we don't start with oh God is essence and then work out, you know, through cat, uh, uh, properties of opposition the different persons, because God comes to us and reveals that um, He is three persons. Mm-hmm. So that's concerned now. We don't have to, obviously, we're running out of time. Is there any questions that anybody has in the chat that we could, people could throw in and then um, feel free to bow out any time, but I'd love, and why don't you ask uh, Dr. Rasmussen since he'll leave first. So let's direct, if anybody, my gosh, the chat's going so fast. Holy smokes. How do I slow this down? Somebody ask a question quick. I can't even read it. It's going so fast. <laughs> they must, you know, what's happened is probably um, turned into a debate um, in the chat. I don't know if you ever see stuff starts. Yeah, happening. I don't know. I mean, which means none of you guys were listening to us. <laughs> no, it means they were listening to us and we were representing sides in some debate. Um, well, we kind of were, I mean, we were sort of dancing around some interesting topics and I guess we won't do any, um, it's going to, too fast, but let's see. Did you have a final, I've got just a a couple more minutes here. Did you have something else that you were going to show? Oh, Uh, I was thinking about different things within the realm of epistemology. Um, I think what kind of inspired me was sellers, um, my PhD advisor, um, Dr. James O'Shea, um, I'm going to plug his book real quick. Hold on a second. Uh, he's a Kantian Salarian scholar. Okay. Um, I don't know if you do this. Do you use books inside of books inside of books? Sometimes for bookmarks, bookmarks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't usually nest it three le- levels deep, but um, no, that's just interesting. Two levels deep. Yeah. Okay. Bro, I was just joking. Um, <laughs> various kind of critiques of the found the variety of foundationalist epistemologies um one of them somebody interesting you're probably familiar with peter klein Mm -hmm. um he has an interesting argument from arbitrariness and it basically goes if foundationalism is true then there are basic beliefs of the following kind S's basic belief that P is justified, although there are no further reasons that make it even slightly better that S believe P rather than any of P's contraries. Number there two, are no reasons or that the subject is not aware right, of Right, because do, doesn't foundationalism kind of say that it's going to ground out? Um, I mean, I'm happy to say that there are infinitely many reasons, even if a subject is not aware of those infinitely many reasons. So in yes, my view, there true. are some basic beliefs. The beliefs, I think, are actually grounded in reasons that aren't themselves beliefs, depending on how you analyze beliefs um, and reasons. They're grounded in something, okay? And that something could be analyzed in different ways. It could be a reliable belief-forming process. It could be a properly functioning uh, cognitive system, a la Plantinga, um, or it could be some kind of acquaintance relation, which is kind of my preferred hypothesis. It could even be different for different beliefs. Um, so I don't think that those would be arbitrary because what makes it justified is that it's grounded in the right way. And the ones that aren't justified aren't grounded in that way. Yeah, he needs a further argument for this. And I think 
that he does, that alone is not going to stand because... I mean, honestly, I don't see how to avoid foundationalism because the alternatives are the infinite regress and the vicious circularity. That's it. I mean, what what else what else is there? I mean, I even think that your view is a foundationalist view. It's just that you have the knowledge of God as sort of like this important foundation. Uh, I'd probably say it only differs insofar as I don't think there's any givens. I think that every scene um, is conceptualized. Everything's theory contaminated. Yeah, that that's fair, and that's consistent with foundationalism, broadly oh. conceived. Oh, it is. Yeah. It could oh, yeah. Be. I mean, there's the classical foundationalist picture. There's internalist foundationalism. There's also externalist foundationalism. Yeah, that's Planiga is a foundationalist. He's an externalist. See, um, we got an can... argument about like um, Jay in the chat there, whether um, he was a foundationalist. I thought he did, and then you know his article. Well, that makes sense. So he's critiquing classical foundationalism. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and I was in his seminar when he made this distinction um, between the classical and moderate. And I don't remember it crystal clearly, but if I remember it, I mean, it, unless I'm confused, I'm pretty sure planning a, would call himself a foundationalist, just not in the classical sense. There was another one that, so I guess there's a couple different things that, and maybe not every foundationalist has this and we'll have to tweak my arguments accordingly. But that first, that givens um, can be immediately present um, outside of uh, you know concepts. Um, what's the word I should use? Cognitive penetration, I guess. Concepts infecting the way that. Um, and I certainly would deny self-evident propositions. And then I'm not a Quinean, but I think I've taken something of his kind of coherentism that I just don't believe that, and this would go to things like basic beliefs and self-evident propositions, that they exist in kind of a verificationalist or atomistic isomorphic way. Yeah. That it's within kind of a web of belief. Yeah, I'm um, totally with you on that. And I feel like this is oh, really an important point because it points back again to the individuality of your epistemic position and that your your epistemic position is based on your total life history, mm -hmm. your total set of experiences. And, and I know when I used to think of self-evident beliefs, I would think of them as sort of universally self-evident. Remember, there was this survey that showed that um, 55 or you know some percentage of people don't believe that whatever begins to exist has a cause. And I thought, oh, well then therefore it's not self-evident because if it's self-evident, everybody who considers it mm -hmm. finds it evident. And then I shifted um, towards a view, I think that's closer to the view that you're articulating, which is sensitive to your particular epistemic position. Like it might be evident to you given your experience, given let's say even your relationship with God that might even make a difference to whether it's evident to you. I know that when I'm in relationship with Rachel, my wife, there are certain cognitive states that I'm in that make certain things more evident. If I'm in a state of, let's say, feeling hurt about something, <laughs> certain things that she's saying may not seem evident than when I'm in a state of feeling relaxed or in love with her. And yeah. so I think this really does go to your point that your relationship, that the personhood, the person connection is actually relevant to the foundation of epistemology, to what you know, to what you find evident. Do you think the heart of my concern then is really this kind of meta-analysis and meta-justification? Because I guess we could all agree that like, if it's evidence or justification, um, then yeah, then you are justified in either having that basic belief um, I don't even think a coherentist would deny that. It, yeah. He I think you're kind of worried way. about that autonomy, that autonomy. sort of self-reliance. I can build that, that the true, whole yeah. knowledge sort of on my own. I am the center of right. reality and and I can figure it all out. I think I that might be really like, a root of what, what you're concerned about. Yeah, that, with. I think that is too. And I think when you were saying too about like evidence, like an individual evidence too, 
I mean, that was one of my concerns too, is that people always throw this, well, let's just look at the evidence, right? Um, you always see this with atheists, right? But then you find Some out atheists. that their evidence is um, only empirical evidence. Yeah, what do you mean? And the evidence is if it's sort of out there. It's out there, universally accessible, and that evidence is seen in the same way. And I think you already hit on this point that I think evidence is theory contaminated. So even the evidence itself looks the way it does because of the ideas that you have. And I've got this, I'll end with this unless you wanted to ask something else, but this was from Siegel. It's kind of variation on Siegel's argument that, um, you know, we don't just see things. We don't just see the evidence and um, therefore you can just say the evidence. And in fact, perhaps if we have the wrong ideas, so I guess the idea is this is sort of a critique of like phenomenal conservatism that we could have like our phenomenon of appearance constitute is being properly basic and juxtapository for other beliefs. Well, the first question you're going to want to know is that, well, if you're justified, it's a good justification. If, if, it, if it's bad, then, you know, no, then that belief wouldn't be um, justified. So suppose um, you have this girl, Jill. Jack and Jill, they, they ran up a hill. Um, and Jill thinks that Jack is angry. Well, let's suppose for the sake of the argument that Jill's actually unjustified in this belief. Now, if Jill infers, let's say, further conclusions from her belief that Jack is angry, let's acknowledge, well, those conclusions would be um, unjustified as well because they're being inferred from something unjustified. But now let's suppose for the sake of the argument that Jill's belief that Jack is angry causes her to see Jack's face like um, in an angry expression. Now, there's a scene as that we, that a phenomenal conservative would, would think would be properly basic. It's not a belief, it's an experience. And the experience is Jack's face looks to Jill like an angry face. But that's a misinterpretation on Jill's part, right? And let's say any other observer is going to say, no, his face um, has the perception that the face, he's not looking angry. Jill's not aware of that, that her perception, so this kind of goes to the ex a critique of externalism that you don't have to be aware of that. So Jill's not aware that her perception has been inf has influenced her belief um, in any way. Um, and let's say, nor has she any other defeaters, because I think phenomenal conservative says you're justified as long as you don't have any defeaters or something like that uh, for the position that Jack's face is angry. So if that variety of foundationalism, i.e., let's call it phenomenal conservatism, that can have these basic cognitive acts, uh, it appears to me, be basic and justificatory, then mm -hmm. it seems that um, if that view is true, Jill's actually now going to have justification for believing that Jack is angry mm -hmm. because it arises directly from her mere appearance. How could she yeah. be wrong about her appearance? But um, that seems to be unjustified. Um, uh, some let's say, it, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I, I would have thought it's a fruit of, it's a good thing if a theory can make a distinction between truth and justification. I mean, we want to have some way of understanding how there could be a belief that fails to be true, but doesn't thereby fail to be justified, unless we think that truth and justified justification are the same thing. But, you know, my understanding is that epistemologists would distinguish between a belief matching with reality in the sense of being true 
versus a person with that belief being sort of proper in their holding that belief. Right. Like yeah, if you see I, a, if you see a clock and it's pointed at the right time, but it's a broken clock and you don't know that it's broken and you form the true belief that it's 405, it's a true belief, but it may not be sort of in a sense, well, may, maybe it's justified sort of internally, but it's not uh, sort of pro your beliefs, not properly related to reality. It's sort of true by well, accident. That's given. I think most people would understand that that'd be like, okay, the belief or judgment as it corresponds externally, to reality wouldn't be justified. But I thought that in phenomenal conservatism was a type of uh, uh, foundationalism that thought that um, your mere sensings and appearings, those cognitive acts. Yeah, they provide justification. They provide justification. And then this example from Siegel was supposed to be like a counter example that, uh -huh. okay, because it doesn't all seem the justified. criteria of what you would say is a justification. She doesn't have any counter examples um, or sorry, defeaters. Yeah. Um, it's incorrigible. It's indubitable. You can't doubt it. Um, yet you would say um, it was unjustified. Why? Because a previous belief that's unjustified is actually affecting the way that, so anything that is drawn out of that, whether another belief or uh, sensing or appearing, if it's based out of something unjustified itself would be unjustified. I thought that was I kind see. Of yeah, point. no, I, I got you now. It's a little bit like a Gettier case. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to think more about that one. That's yeah, interesting. I thought that was kind of yeah. fun. That's clever. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. And let's, you know, let's keep working together. And yeah. um, I've, you talked about stuff with the philosophy of mind. Um, I think there's some great arguments um, that we could work out against materialism. I always liked, I typically don't give them on most people because they're pretty sophisticated, but I like the conceivability and, and modal arguments mm -hmm. um, against materialism and um those are good. Um, let's see. And then, you know, arguments from, you know, consciousness and stuff like that would be excellent too. Any closing thoughts or? Well, this has been a lot of fun. I mean, lots of interesting topics. I would love to connect further. And I just appreciate kind of that combination between the theoretical and the practical. And when you talked about humility and that sort of of relationship with person with God as being something that like is very meaningful. You know, it's not disconnected yeah. from well, philosophy. And so the sort of theoretical and the practical and personal, I think it's really powerful and really cool. But yeah. Thank you for having me on. This has been thank really you. a lot of fun. Uh, what an honor. And um, I wish you all the best. Um, thank you. And your future work and um, teaching. Um, it must be, I don't know if you're doing face to face, it's right online. Now. It's working. Yeah, it's, it's on. Yeah, it's online. Well, hopefully next semester they'll have some available face to face because it's much better. I yeah. Think, to have the abstract <laughs> connect with the the face to face and real practical. Um, so thank you again, Josh, and uh, thank you. Blessings of the Lord. Uh, can't thank you enough. Thank you. Blessings. All right. Bye -bye. All right. Bye.